Throughout this course, I've shown you several cases where the code that we've written has resulted in an error during request processing. Sometimes that error has resulted in an error message being displayed to the user. Other times, however, it's resulted in a blank page with no other information for the user to understand what happened or what they can do about it. In this video, I'll show you how to react to those errors in a much more user-friendly manner. Let's start out by adding a controller action to our application that always produces an error so that we can refresh our memory as to what the default error page looks like. To do this, go to the home controller and add the following controller action that will allow us to cause an error whenever we like. Then we can run the application and navigate to slash home slash cause an error to see the error in the browser. There, now we've got a good example of an error page to clean up. Because error pages, such as the ones we'd like to display in our application, are such a common problem, the ASP.NET team has actually provided us with some libraries to help give us a little more information about the problems we're having, so we don't have to write the code to do it ourselves. It's another piece of middleware, much like the ASP.NET MVC framework we've been using, and, like the ASP.NET MVC framework, in order to start using it, we've got to register it with the ASP.NET middleware pipeline. Like all the other functionality we've added in this course, the first thing we need to do in order to use the error and diagnostics middleware libraries are to add the package to our project. To do this, open up the project.json file and add the package named microsoft.aspnet.diagnostics as a dependency. Then open up our startup class and jump down to the configure method and add the command app.useErrorPage. Be sure to run this command before any other middleware, such as the MVC middleware, is registered so that it has the first say in how errors are handled. Then save the file and switch back to the browser that's currently showing the old error page and refresh this page to see the new error page middlewares jumping in and showing us a much more nicely formatted error page than that default error page. The diagnostics library also gives us another cool piece of middleware. To see it in action, simply add the line app.useRuntimeInfo page. Then switch over to your browser and navigate to slash RuntimeInfo to see the list of libraries our application is currently referencing, as well as their version numbers and location on disk. All this information is very useful in troubleshooting when assembly versioning issues arise. Now, all of this diagnostics information is great for us as developers when we're developing our application, but we don't want real users to see this stuff, do we? Well, the diagnostics library actually gives us one more really helpful piece of middleware, and that is app.useErrorHandler. This middleware actually listens for any exceptions that may occur during the course of a request and then logs the error and redirects the request to a friendly error page that is more helpful for a user of the site who doesn't really care about the stack trace in which the error occurred. In order to work, this middleware requires the path to the page that should be displayed when an error occurs. Since we don't yet have such a page in our site, we'll just tell the user error handler middleware to reroute requests to the slash home slash error URL and then we'll quickly go ahead and create a new controller action at this URL to display this error page. The quickest way to do this is just copy the existing index action and rename it to error. Likewise, we can just copy the existing index view and rename it to error, and then open up that view and replace all of its markup with a simple error message. When I'm done, I'll switch back to the browser and refresh the page to try it out. When I refresh the URL that we added before that produces an error, I see by the error page shown in the browser that my custom error page logic has executed properly. And there you have it, a basic custom error page. In the previous video, I showed you how to show error and diagnostics information, which can be a great help to you when you're developing your application. I also showed you how to create custom error pages that capture those errors and hide them from the users of your site who aren't really interested in seeing the full details of every error that occurs. In this video, I'll show you how to leverage custom configuration settings that will make it easy to turn these custom error pages on and off depending on what environment your application is running in. In order to begin using the configuration middleware, we must first add a reference to the middleware package in our project.json file. To do this, We'll add another line in the dependencies section and search for microsoft.framework.configurationmodel. 
Now, once we've added that reference, let's begin using it. First, we'll jump back to the startup class and take a look at the code we've written so far. Notice the three error and diagnostics handlers I've registered in the previous video. These are the behaviors of our site that we'll want to be different depending on whether we're in a debug mode or not. Specifically, when we are debugging our application, we'll want to have the use error handler and use runtime info page middleware features available. But when we're running in a production mode, we only want the use error handler middleware registered and neither of the first two. So let's use configuration settings to determine which middleware features should be enabled. The first thing we need to do to start using the configuration API is to get a configuration instance. We can do this with a simple variable instance. The configuration type lives in the Microsoft.Framework.Configuration model namespace, so you'll have to import that namespace in order to use it. Now that we have an instance of the configuration object, we can start building onto it, reading in configuration settings from various places. We'll start simply by importing the environment variables. If you've used any other web application framework, you'll probably be familiar with the environment variables as they're a pretty common configuration mechanism because they're a decent way to define settings that change between different machines and environments, like a development machine or a production web server. We import the environment variables into our configuration object using the built-in add environment variables method. If I add a breakpoint after this configuration line and run the site in the debugger and inspect the configuration object, I can see that ASP.NET has read a whole bunch of variables for my current environment and put them in this configuration object ready to be used by my application. But before I use them, let's add one more source of configuration values, an INI file. The INI file format is very simple, and it's actually pretty old. It's a syntax for defining configuration settings in a key value pair approach. If you've ever seen a Windows registry settings file or the old Windows boot.ini file that defines startup settings, then you've seen that INI file format in action. We can add a reference to the INI file by using the add INI file method and pointing it to a file in our project. Let's call it config.ini. Then we'll go ahead and create that new config.ini file by right clicking on the project and selecting add new file, and then just selecting the text file option. We'll name the file config.ini and then hit OK to finish. Now that the file is created, we'll go ahead and open it and put in a single debug configuration value and set it to true. Next, we'll jump back to the startup class and start using that new config setting by using the config.get method to tell ASP.NET to read through all of the registered configuration sources and find the best setting with that name. Once we're done doing that, we can save and then execute the site with F5 to open up a browser and see it work. Now we can navigate to that custom error page that we added in the previous video and see our development error page. However, if we switch back to the config file and switch that setting to false and then save, we can now see the custom error page message when we head back over and refresh the browser. While the INI file format is pretty simple and straightforward, many web developers are far more comfortable with the JSON file format instead. Luckily, there's a library that supports configuration settings stored as JSON too. To start using it, simply switch over to the package.json file and copy the configuration line and add .json to the end of the package name. Then go back to the startup class and switch our configuration code from add INI file to add JSON file and change the file extension from .ini to .json. Next, rename the actual file name to match and change it from the INI format to the JSON format this time defining the debug setting value as a JSON Boolean value. When we're all done, save all of our files and then switch back to the browser and see it reading from our new JSON file. The nice thing about the configuration API is that it's really versatile and supportive of a variety of configuration file management approaches. For example, one popular approach is to define one configuration file with all the default configuration values, and then let developers define their own versions of the file on their local file machines by changing the extension of the file to .user or dev.json. To do this with the configuration API, simply add another add JSON file method call to a second configuration file named config.dev.json, but this time add in a second parameter set to true 
to indicate that this configuration file is optional. That tells the configuration API that if it exists at runtime, then go ahead and read it in. Otherwise, just keep going with the configuration that you've already got. I'm going to test this out by switching to the browser and refreshing the page without adding the custom file and see that everything continues to work as it did before the custom configuration file was added. Then we'll jump back into Visual Studio and I'll make a copy of the config.json file and I'll rename it to config.dev.json and change the debug setting to true. After I've done this, I can switch back to the browser again, refresh the page and see we're back to the nice developer friendly error page registered when we were in debug mode. Remove this file again, refresh the site, and we're back to the false value from our config.json. Now that we've got all of that working, we can actually refactor our code a bit. Since it's a pretty standard practice to put Boolean values and other types like this into configuration files, the configuration API offers a generic overload to the get method that allows you to request the configuration value as a certain type, a Boolean for example and the API will take care of deserializing the configuration value for you. To show this in action, go ahead and change the config.get call to config.get of type bool and save and rerun the site to see that everything still works great. Now that we're able to read some basic configuration settings, let's move on to a little bit more interesting topic, secret configuration settings. Secret configuration settings are things like login credentials and database connection strings that applications require in order to function, but that developers generally don't like adding to plain text configuration files so that just anybody with access to the file can read it. To help support these scenarios, Microsoft offers yet another implementation of the configuration API called User Secrets. To use it, we first need to add a reference to the package by making a copy of the configuration line in the project.json and tacking on user secrets at the end. Next, we have to set the secret settings before we can begin using them. The easiest way to do this is to right click on the ASP.NET project in Solution Explorer and select the Manage User Secrets option. This will pop open a JSON text file that we can begin editing, just like the JSON configuration file that we were just editing. The difference is, this file is in a far more secure location and only accessible to the current user. Let's pretend to add a password setting in this file and set a value. Now when we want to read that password setting, we can jump back to the startup class and add a reference to the user secrets functionality by adding another call onto the configuration variable called add user secrets. With that setup in place, we can then use the standard configuration API to read the password setting into a variable. To show this working, I'll add a debug breakpoint right after this call and then run the site in debug mode. When the debugger hits, we can see that sure enough, the secret password setting has been loaded and is now available to our application. In this video, I showed you a couple ways to help manage custom configuration settings so that you can more easily move your application between different environments. In the next video, I'll show you how to increase the maintainability of your application even more by introducing a pattern called dependency injection. In the previous video, I showed you how to use configuration to make your site more maintainable. In this video, I'll show you how to leverage ASP.NET 5's built-in support for dependency injection to make it much easier to keep your business logic out of your controllers and in your model where it belongs. Let's start by taking a look at a controller in our sample application that could really benefit from some dependency injection, the post controller, and specifically the two actions in this controller that create instances of the blog data context in order to interact with the database. Now, sure, the current implementation functions perfectly fine, but from a design standpoint, the fact that this controller is creating a new instance of the blog data context is a real problem because the job of the post controller is to manage posts, not connections to the database. We can solve this design problem using a technique called dependency injection. As the name implies, dependency injection is the act of injecting or passing an instance of a component that another component depends on. In the example of the post controller and blog data context, the post controller is dependent on the instance of the blog data context in order to get its job done. And ideally creating that blog data context instance should be some other components concern. And the controller should just request an instance of the blog data context and be given one 
without having to know or care where that instance came from. That is the concept of dependency injection. There are several ways to implement the concept of dependency injection, but by far the easiest and most widely used is constructor injection, or requesting a dependency by way of requiring it as a parameter on a class's constructor. In the example of our blog data context, that would mean adding a constructor to our controller and adding a blog data context parameter to it. Then, the constructor can save a reference to this parameter so that the controller action can use it later. Then we can update all these references where we're creating our own new blog data context and replace them with the one that's been injected in. Now let's save this and run this new code to see what happens. This time when we run the application, we see a new error that we haven't seen yet, unable to resolve service for type blog data context. That error message is coming from ASP.NET's built-in dependency injection container, the component that's responsible for figuring out how to create new instances of the classes that our controller is requesting via constructor injection. In other words, every time ASP.NET MVC tries to create a new instance of a controller, it checks to see if that controller has any dependencies that need to be fulfilled. When that is the case, ASP.NET takes care of everything required for creating that dependency and passing it or injecting it into the controller. This is dependency injection in action. While ASP.NET is pretty smart about when and how to create components, it does need some information to help it make the best decisions. For instance, recall back when I first tried to register the ASP.NET MVC middleware and I got that error message about services not being registered? That was ASP.NET telling me that it didn't have enough information to wire up the ASP.NET MVC framework's internal dependencies, which also used this dependency injection technique. When I ran that services.addMVC method though, the logic in that method told ASP.NET everything it needed to know and everything started working. Likewise, we can configure how ASP.NET will create our dependencies as well. Simply go back to the same method where we configured the MVC dependencies and add the following line to tell ASP.NET that it should create a brand new instance of the blog data context every time a component requests one. Now, there's a couple other options that we have in here, in addition to creating a new instance every time. We can use add singleton to create only one instance for the entire lifetime of the application, or something in the middle of singleton and transient, add scoped, which will create one instance for every web request. This last option is generally the option that you'll use the most, creating everything you need to handle each request, and then cleaning it up when you're done handling the request. When you're done adding that code, you can go ahead and run the site one more time and see it working. I know rerunning the site to see that nothing has changed is a very underwhelming demo. However, the goal of everything I've shown in this video was to make our code cleaner and more maintainable rather than to add new functionality. In fact, why don't you move on to the next video where I'll show you another trick to clean up your code. Managing your application URLs by placing attributes right on individual controller actions rather than depending on the centralized routing configuration I showed previously. Earlier in this chapter, I showed you how to leverage ASP.NET 5's built-in support for dependency injection to inject dependencies into your MVC controllers. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can also leverage dependency injection to dynamically add properties directly to your Razor views. To demonstrate why we might need dependency injection in our views, let's start by opening up our post.cshtml view that displays the details of our blog posts. Take a look at how we're rendering the posted date property. When we leave it up to Razor to render this, it ends up displaying some long string with the time, including seconds and everything. But what if we only want to display the date? Well, that's easy enough too. Razor lets us call the toString method right here in our view to specify a format string. So if we change it to the following code, we get what we're looking for. That's all well and good, but what if we applied this approach all over our application and then wanted to change the way that we displayed all of our dates wherever they were rendered? Well, then we'd have to search for all of those references and update them everywhere. Wouldn't it be nicer if we centralize this formatting logic in one place? Let's go ahead and do that. First, we'll create a new class to hold this logic. I'll call it formatting service and I'll put it in the models folder. 
Then I'll create a new method in this class named asReadableDate and execute the same logic as in our view to render the custom date string. Next, I'll jump back to my view and register this new class as a property in the view by using the at inject keyword at the top of the view. And this keyword takes two parameters separated by spaces. The first parameter is the type that should be injected. And the second parameter is the name of the property that should be dynamically created. Here I'm indicating that I want to inject the formatting service and I want to call the property that gets injected format. With this line in place, I can then refer to this property with the name I just defined and updated my current code to use the new service instead of the inline two string call that we currently have. And notice how I get full IntelliSense as I reference this property. Now that I've added my new property and begun using it, I'm almost ready to run the application, but I still have one more thing left to do. You see, this technique leverages ASP.NET's built-in dependency injection framework. And as I demonstrated in earlier videos, that framework doesn't like it when you ask for types that it doesn't know about. Luckily, this is easy enough to solve. Simply jump to the startup class and add a registration line in the configure services method, just like the line we added previously to register the blog data context class. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter whether we register this type as transient, scoped, or singleton, but when in doubt, Go ahead and use the add transient method to register the type, which tells ASP.NET to create a new instance of the class every single time one is requested. And with this last piece of the puzzle in place, we can finally see the injected property in action. Just run the site and view a post to see the nicely formatted text. Now changing the date formatting across the entire site is as simple as changing one method. In this video, I showed you how to reuse logic throughout your views. Now check out the next video where I'll show you how to reuse entire views by turning them into view components. In the previous chapter, I showed you how to leverage partial views to reuse parts of your Razor markup. And in the previous few videos, I showed you how to leverage dependency injection techniques to reuse logic. In this video, I'm going to show you how to reuse both logic and views together by leveraging an ASP.NET MVC feature called View Components. Now, partial views are a great way to reuse parts of your Razor markup in different places of your site, but what happens when you want to reuse more than just the markup? What happens when your view depends on some logic to execute or for some model to be created prior to rendering? View Components help solve this scenario by providing you with an easy and convenient way to both execute logic and render the result all with one call to an HTML helper. To find a good example of a scenario when a view component would be helpful, we have to look no further than the homepage of our sample application. See this section labeled Archives in the right-hand column? That section is currently just hard-coded HTML in our layout, but if it were really implemented, it would involve going to the database and figuring out what months have posts in them and then rendering links to those posts. So even if we were to put this markup in a partial view, where would that corresponding database access logic go? And keep in mind, it's in our layout, so it would have to be executed for every action that implemented that layout. Surely, we wouldn't want to execute the same database code in every single controller of our application, so where would we put it? Let's put it in a view component. Since a view component consists of a view and a class that contains the corresponding logic for that view, we'll need to create both of those two things. The view component class is the most important part because it's the artifact that ASP.NET MVC looks for in order to find out about your component, so let's begin by creating that first. To do that, simply create a folder named View Components in the root of your application. Note that you can name this folder anything you like. ASP.NET MVC doesn't care. Then we'll add a new class to this folder named Archived Posts View Component. Although ASP.NET MVC doesn't care about the name of the folder your component lives in, it does require a few other things to be in place in order to recognize a class as a view component. The first requirement is that the name of the class ends with the suffix view component. Now we've named our class archived post view component, so we've satisfied that criteria already. The second requirement is that the class be decorated with the attribute view component. And finally, the last requirement is that the class extend from the view component base class. With these three requirements met, ASP.NET MVC will now be able to discover our view component. The only thing left to do now is implement it. 
When the component is invoked from a view, ASP.NET MVC looks for a public method on the view component class named invoke that accepts the same number of parameters that the component was invoked with and returns an instance of I view component result. Our component won't accept any parameters, so our invoke method will look like this. Just to get this working for now, let's just return a default view with a simple call to the view method on the view component base class. Though this isn't the same exact view helper method that's available on the controller base class, it's implemented to work in just the same way. We'll come back and populate this method with some real logic in just a few minutes, but for now, let's jump right in and invoke this new class from a view. To do that, just use the component.invokeHelper method in the view that you wish to render the view component in. Since I want to render this view component in the layout of the site, I'll open up the layout view and find the archives section. Then I'll make a copy of the HTML for later and I'll replace it with a call to the component.invoke method, passing in the name of my view component, archive posts. Or even better, I can use the generic version of the invoke method to make a strongly typed reference to the view component. Notice how I've wrapped the call in parentheses so Razor doesn't confuse the generic parameter with an HTML tag. Also, if I wanted to pass in parameters to my component, I could do so here. Now it's time to create the view for this new view component, but the question is, where should the view live? To this point, I've shown you how to put controller views in folders named after the controller that they were created for, and I've shown you how to use the shared folder to share views between controllers. However, view components are not controllers, so they don't get to use the same folders that controllers do. To find the answer to the question of where we should put our views, let's just run the application and let ASP.NET MVC tell us where it's trying to find the view. From this error message, I can see that ASP.NET MVC is attempting to locate a view named default.cshtml in one of two folders. Each of the folders ends with the path slash components slash the name of the view component, in this case, archived posts. Interestingly enough, ASP.NET MVC will allow us to place the view for this component underneath both the controller folder and the shared folder. Now, I'm only going to create one view in this course, but the fact that ASP.NET MVC looks in both the controller and the shared folder path means that you can actually create controller-specific versions of your view component views if you like. Okay, now that we know where to put it, let's create the new view. I'll start by creating a new folder in the shared folder path that ASP.NET MVC just told me about. Views, shared, components, and then the name of the component, archive posts. Then I'll create a new ASP.NET MVC view named default.cshtml. And then I'll paste the hard-coded mockup that I just copied from the layout file. Now that I've created the view, I should be able to run the site and see the view component in action. And that's all you need to do in order to create a view component. However, this example is a little silly since all we've really done is move some hard-coded markup around. Let's actually implement some logic to prove that the new view component really does act as a self-contained unit. We'll start by jumping back to the view component class where we left off with just the default call to the view method to return a simple view. Let's turn this into a database query to find all of the months that we have posts for and the number of posts in that month. To do that, we'll use the blog data context. And hey, what a great opportunity to try out that dependency injection technique I just showed you a few videos ago. To get a reference to the blog data context, I'll create a constructor that takes the context as a parameter. And I'll save a reference to the context as a field variable so that the invoke method can access it. Since I now have a reference to the blog data context, I'm going to switch to that context and create a method containing the link query to get the data that I need. Of course, this link query and method won't work unless I create this new class that I'm referring to, so I'll go ahead and create that in my models folder. Then I'll go back to my view component, call the method on the data context, and then pass the results of this query to the view. And finally, I'll go and update the view. With all of this in place, we can run the application and see our new component in action, making the database call and rendering the total number of posts for each month of posts in the database. And there you have it, a fully functional view component. 
If you're interested in more ways to better organize and customize your application, check out the next video where I'll show you how to go beyond the basic routing logic and map your controller actions directly to customized URLs. So far in this chapter, I've shown you several techniques that allow you to upgrade your application from merely functional to really maintainable. In this video, I'm going to show you how to define your routes using attributes to make your applications easier to maintain while at the same time giving you better control over the URLs that your site exposes to the world. Customizing your site's URLs is a great way to improve your search engine rankings. However, even if you aren't concerned about where your site places in Google search results, leveraging customized URLs may help your site be more accessible in different ways as well. To help demonstrate why we might want to customize our site's URLs, let's take a look at how our default route configuration drives our URLs right now. Keep in mind that our default route currently follows the pattern of controller slash action slash ID, which means that if we want to view the blog post with the ID of one, then we'll have to navigate to slash posts slash posts slash one. However, wouldn't it be nice if we can make this URL a little more meaningful, like say slash post slash 2015 slash six slash the title of my post. Luckily, this is pretty easy to do. To begin, let's build the controller action that we want to customize the post action on the post controller. In order to customize the URL for this controller action, we'll simply place the route attribute on top of this action and pass it a string parameter that defines the custom route pattern to apply to this action. Notice how I've added a new feature to our route parameters, a colon, followed by a type. This is known as a route parameter constraint, and it restricts the URLs that will match this route even further than just the URL structure alone. In other words, since I've specified that the year and month placeholders must be integer values, this route pattern will not match a URL that has non-numeric characters in these sections of the URL. In that case, it will simply fall through to the default route that we defined in the startup class. When the URL does match these constraints, however, the values in the URL that match the placeholders in the route pattern will be mapped to their corresponding controller action parameters, just as they do in the standard routing approach that I showed previously. Now that I have this route parameter defined, I can add those parameters to my controller action. An integer parameter named year, another integer parameter named month, and a third string parameter named key. Note that the order that these parameters appear in the controller action does not have to match the order that they appear in the route pattern. You can put them in any order you like and ASP.NET MVC will still map them correctly. With these parameters in place, I can update my query logic to find the correct post. Though the custom URL makes things nicer for the users of our site, it does make a little more work for us as developers to come up with the proper query since we can no longer just use the simple find by ID approach. Let's start with the easy part and update our existing query to find the posts that are in the year and month that we're looking for like so. Now for the hard part. Where do we get this key parameter? Well, we have to add that property to our post object first. We've got a couple of different ways to do this, but let's just use the simplest approach and add a read-only property that gives us a URL encoded version of our title property using the following code. This piece of code will take the title and strip out all of the characters that might cause a problem if they ended up on the URL and leave us with a string that we can show to users. With that in place, go ahead and add the final criteria to our filter. Now this is everything that we need in order to customize the URL of our action. We could run the application right now and see it in action. However, since we added this action, why don't we update the redirect to action call at the end of the create method to point to this new action rather than the old one whenever we create a new post. Luckily, it's easy to change which action is called, just change the parameters that are passed. So change the current parameter list from just ID to include year, month, and key properties from the post object. And now when we run, we should be redirected to our nice new URL. Now once you've done that, go ahead and try it all out. Run the application, navigate to the create post page, create a new post, and check out the URL of the newly created post. Of course, this URL also works for previously created posts as well. You just need to figure out what their URL should be and try it out.